Okay, so today we're going to be learning about how to draw um, one diagram that often has two different names, which is it's either called a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram. Now, both of those are really complicated names, but basically the idea is that these are graphic representations, um, or we could say a model of the history of evolution. And we can actually test these models to see if they really tell the story of evolution, because that's the goal. Um, so we're just going to jump right in and try to do an example of a phylogenetic tree. Um, and we're going to try to do a phylogenetic tree for these animals here. So these are some pretty unrelated or seemingly unrelated animals, the shark, a fish, an amphibian, a primate, um, a rodent, like a rabbit, uh, crocodiles, and birds. So these are all pretty different, but we're going to see or try to figure out the history of how these evolved. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is come up with a property that all of these things have in common. So it turns out that all of these things, all these animals, have a vertebrae. So we're going to start with that trait. Um, let's try spelling that again. Okay, so all of these different animals have vertebrae. And we want to go ahead and start our phylogenetic tree there with a little mark that says vertebrae. Every single one of them has those. So the next thing we want to do is we want to look for a trait that includes all the animals except one. All right, and so it turns out that there is one of these animals, or most of these animals have what we call a bony skeleton. So their skeleton is actually made of bone. And one of the animals doesn't have a bony skeleton. It has a skeleton made out of cartilage. And that animal is the shark. So sharks um, do not have this bony skeleton. Everything else does. The way we're going to show that on our cladogram is we're going to draw a line going to the shark. okay? And we're going to draw a line headed in the direction of everything else. Um, and we'll identify that somewhere along this branch over here is where the bony skeleton evolved. Whereas the ancestors of sharks must have branched off from the other vertebrates before bony skeletons evolved. So that tells us that these guys over here, because they all have bony skeletons, are more closely related to each other than they are to the shark. All right, so the next thing that we're going to look at, we want to find another fish or another organism out of this group um, that has a trait or, or that is lacking a trait, I should say, that all of the other ones have. Um, and so that trait, the next one to evolve, is the trait of four limbs. We call these organisms tetrapods, which means four feet. So all of these guys have four limbs, but the ray-finned fish doesn't. So that tells us that these fish their ancestors, long, long, long ago, must have broken away from the rest of the group after developing bony skeletons, but before developing four limbs. All right, now we're looking for, and we probably figured out the pattern already, we're looking for a trait that all of these organisms have, but the amphibian doesn't have. And so it turns out that there is a type of egg called the amniotic egg that all of these organisms have. And that's, um, you could think of like an egg with yolk. Now you might think about 
the fact that rodents and primates don't actually lay eggs, but they basically keep their eggs inside of them. So they have this structure just in a little bit different form. Um, whereas amphibians don't have that. They don't have a yolk in the eggs that they produce. So this tells us that the story goes that the ancestors of amphibians must have broken off from the rest after the development of four limbs, but before the development of the amniotic egg. All right. And so on and so forth. Now it's going to get a little bit more complicated here because when we look at these guys, we see that there are some traits that these two have. The primates and rodents, for example, they both have hair, whereas crocodiles and birds do not have hair. So we need to actually split the whole thing here. And we're going to say that along this branch, hair develops. And along this branch, hair does not develop. So we're going to look for something that these two have in common, which is something that we call a pre-orbital fenestra. Now that's a really big word that means a hollow place in the skull in front of the eye. So if we had a pre-orbital fenestra, we'd have a, a hollow spot somewhere in the bridge of our nose. Um, crocodiles and birds have that because it makes their heads lighter, um, which is good for birds because they can fly, and good for crocodiles because they have really big heads, so it needs to be light one way or another. Now, it turns out crocodiles and birds, we don't have another thing that we're going to be able to distinguish them, so we're not going to add anything else in that branch, um, and primates and rodents, it's the same way. So, this tells us the story. What we've created here is a phylogenetic tree. Um, and I want to be clear of something really quick. This tells us the story of evolutionary history, that vertebrae probably evolved, and then the sharks broke off into their own group, and bony skeletons evolved in some organism, and then the ray-finned fish broke off from that group, and then one ancestor had four limbs, and then the amphibians broke off, and so on and so forth. What it doesn't tell us is the time. So it doesn't tell us that vertebrae evolved first, and then bony skeletons, and then four limbs. And it definitely doesn't tell us how long ago those things evolved. We don't know that. All right. And the other thing we need to know is there's actually other ways to draw this, um, different ways to show this picture. And you'll see those in your book but they really all have the same meaning. So it's just different ways of drawing these lines, whether you draw them as straight lines or curved lines, um, or maybe you make it really pretty and you make it look like a tree. Um, but that doesn't make it an actual different diagram. Okay. Now the next thing we need to understand is that to have a good phylogenetic tree, we want to have all of the organisms that descended from a common ancestor. Okay, so for example, primates, rodents, crocodiles, and birds all must have descended from a common ancestor because they all have the trait of an amniotic egg. All right, so all these guys descended from a common ancestor. In the same way, amphibians, primates, rodents, crocodiles, and birds also all descended from a common ancestor. That makes them what we call a mono, meaning one, phyletic group. So a monophyletic group includes all the organisms descended from the same ancestor. If we were to go over here and look at sharks and ray finned fishes, they are not a monophyletic group because it doesn't include all the organisms descended from a common ancestor. We left out a lot of them, amphibians, primates, rodents, crocodiles, birds. They should be a part of that group, and we didn't include them. All right. Um, a lot of times this word 
monophyletic group can also be exchanged for a different word, which means the same thing, which is a clade. So we can refer to it as a monophyletic group or a clade, and based on which word we use, we're determining whether it's a phylogenetic tree, which is where we get the word monophyletic. Notice that root word that's there. And if it's a cladogram, we call this group a clade. So it's two totally different ways to talk about the exact same thing. I will tell you right now that in this class I'll mostly use the words phylogenetic tree and monophyletic group, but the AP test wants you to know both. So that's why I'm putting them out there. All right, let's do one last thing with our diagram here. Let's ask the question of where should we put another organism, and that organism is going to be um, whales. All right, so where would we add a whale to all of this? Um, we could, let's think about, let's look at these pictures real quick and think about, well, which one looks the most like a whale? Well, I mean, these guys look like whales. They, they live in the ocean, they've got fins. So if I try to put whale right here, we can test to see if that works because a phylogenetic tree is really a hypothesis. You think this is how evolution worked and then you can test it to see if it really did. Um, so if that's true, if the whale belongs here, then the whale should have vertebrae, right? Because notice we would have this line going off to the whale you know, maybe off of the reef and fish or something like that, like right there. Sorry, I drew that little line there. I didn't mean to. Um, so when we do that, that tells us that the whale should be a vertebrae, should have a vertebrae, should be a vertebrate, um, that it should have a bony skeleton. Both of those things are true. And that it should not have any of these things. It shouldn't have four limbs. It shouldn't have an amniotic egg, hair, or a preorbital fenestra. Now, if you look at a whale carefully, especially if you look at a whale's skeleton, you'll find out that there's some problems with that. Because a whale actually does have four limbs. Now, they're tiny. Those back limbs are really, really small. They're just tiny little bones that don't even connect to the spine anymore. But they're there. So the whale can't go there because he has four limbs. All right, so maybe he branches off from the amphibian instead. We could try that. Um, but if we try that, what we're going to discover, to our dismay, is that whales also have amniotic eggs or something like it because they give live birth, just like primates and rodents do. So it can't go there. And then we got to ask ourselves, well, which of these traits does it have? Well, turns out whales have hair, but they do not have preorbital fenestras. So we need to add the whale somewhere over here. He's somewhere on this branch because he has hair, he has an amniotic egg, he has four limbs, he has a bony skeleton, and he has a vertebrae, but he doesn't have the preorbital fenestra. So that's an example of how we can actually test these ideas. Now, the whale's a good example because he does look a lot like a shark or a fish. And that's an example of how sometimes evolution will adapt an organism to an environment that's the same as another organism. So sharks and whales are both adapted to the same environment. So they look very similar. But that doesn't mean they're closely related. It just means they have the same adaptations because they live in the same kind of place.